particular age. This age that we're in has been called the information age. And so I think that we're beyond that, though. I think that we're no longer in the information age. The information age really came as a result of the Internet. But let's be honest, we're a generation removed from the start of the Internet. I mean, the Internet's been around longer than I've been alive. Some of you can say the same thing. You have no living memory of life before the Internet because it didn't exist. And others of you, you have memory a long time after the Internet, but either way, the information age, the Internet rather, brought about the information age. But our age that we presently are in, we're in an age where we appropriate information. And we have these little tools that help us decipher and discover how information is disseminated, and that is called social media. And social media packages information for you. And depending upon your circle of influence, you're either hearing the conversation or you're entering the conversation or you're just simply hearing your own voice repeated back to yourself, depending on your friends that you have. Many of you just simply have friends on social media or followers that you agree with or that agree with you. And those friends who post things that you might not agree with, what happens to them? They get snoozed or they get unfollowed. And in the worst case scenario, they get deleted. None of y'all deleted or snoozed me, hopefully. But social media, one thing about it is that it proves that we are passionate people. We're passionate people who believe that things can change and that things should change. And watch social media as it unfolds. Everybody's cause matters to them. People are very passionate about a particular cause, but here's what we need to be clear on. Not all causes are equal causes. And that's a missing piece from social media. Not everyone's cause is equal. And so that then begs the question, well, who is it that uh, determines what cause matters? Who determines what cause matters? And when do you decide to get behind a particular cause? And have you experienced this maybe? You've lived long enough where you have thought about the causes that you have put a lot of energy into. You were convinced at the time that that cause was right, only to look back later and find out that cause really didn't matter as much as you thought that it did. And so I'm excited today to launch this new series. I'm excited to launch this new series through the book of Galatians called Recovery. And hopefully you've taken an opportunity to get the sermon journal. Josh and Christine have done a fabulous job laying out our series for us. You can pick this up all around our campus, but it's got all kinds of things, a little word for me in the front, as well as an outline of where we're going over the course of this series and space for you to take notes. As well as uh, on the back, we're excited about this recommended resource that will help you as we go through this series. But we're starting this series through Galatians, and this series is called Recovery. And as we think about the changes the pandemic has brought to our world, what I want to do through this series is for us to think carefully and clearly about the things that matter most. Think carefully and clearly about what it is that matters most. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a particular confession, a particular confession that stands above any challenge. We have, as followers of Jesus, a bold assurance that looks into the face of the strongest adversity and says that we can be sure of a brighter tomorrow because Jesus is alive. You see, no matter the length of the night, no matter the darkness of the night, Christian confession says that there will be a brighter today tomorrow. Christian confession says there will be a brighter day tomorrow. You say, what basis can you say that? Because I can take you right now, we can hop on a plane, and we can go over to Jerusalem, and we can visit the place where he lay, and the tomb is empty. He is not there. He is risen. And so as we recover from our present pandemic moment, and I want you to be patient, okay? Just be patient. It's going to take a moment for us to recover. But that, oper that pandemic gives us, in our thinking, culturally, in our appropriation, we have a fresh opportunity to uh, recover what matters most. 
And you and I, as followers of Jesus, Christians, we confess that we have a word to describe what matters most. And we call the word that matters most the gospel. The gospel. And as we're going to learn through this series, nothing matters more than the gospel. And so you may be saying, well, what is the gospel? Well, that's a great question. Because just because I say the word gospel, I'm not assuming that you and I are agreeing on what the gospel is. But what is the gospel? The gospel is not simply a catch-all phrase. Understand that. But the gospel is shorthand. It's a shorthand way of describing the message of God's redeeming work through Jesus Christ. And so here's how I summarize what I understand the gospel to be. Here's a definition for you. Hopefully, you'll write this down. The gospel is the good news of God's loving plan to bring us into fellowship with Himself forever. That's what I mean when I say the gospel. Now, that's a very pregnant term. There's a lot in there. The gospel is the good news of God's loving plan to bring us into fellowship with Himself forever. There's a pastor in New York. He's Pastor Emeritus at this point. He wrote a book. It's a book that I recommended here in the recommended readings. Tim Keller wrote a book called Shaped by the Gospel, and he reminds us in that book that the gospel is not everything. The gospel is not a simple thing. The gospel affects everything. The gospel is not everything. The gospel is not a simple thing. The gospel affects everything everything. And so Tim Keller, he goes on to remind us as we think clearly about the gospel, listen carefully, the gospel is not the result of the gospel. The gospel is not the result of the gospel. So there's a difference, listen, between what the gospel is and what the gospel does. There's a difference between what the gospel is and what the gospel does. Keller says it more eloquently than I can. Listen to what he says. We must not then give the impression that the gospel is simply a divine rehabilitation program for the world, but rather it is an accomplished substitutionary work, that is, something that's been done for us on our behalf instead of us. We must not, Keller says, depict the gospel as primarily joining something, Christ's kingdom program, for example, but rather as receiving something, Christ's finished work. We must not depict the gospel as primarily joining something, but rather as receiving something. And so I want you to turn with me through this series in the book of Galatians. And the reason we turn to the book of Galatians is through Galatians, listen carefully, we're going to discover the source and substance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is going to be, as you can see in your guide, we're going to go all the way through October the 31st. I hope that you're going to be here for every one of those Sundays because we're going to get to unpack the riches of God's Word week by week together. Without further ado, hear the word of our Lord in Galatians 1, the first 10 verses. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, 
If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And this morning we're focusing on Galatians because in it, Paul sets out this strong argument that the fellowship of believers who loses the gospel, listen carefully, a fellowship of believers who loses the gospel has no basis for referring to themselves as a Christian fellowship. A community is Christian only as it faithfully confesses the gospel. So we turn to Galatians to understand the importance of the gospel. Martin Luther, the great reformer, he he wrote something on Galatians. Matter of fact, it was one of his favorite books. He turned to it time and time again. Galatians was probably number one for him, and then the book of Romans. But in his commentary on Galatians, listen, he captures the message of Galatians. Listen to the message, according to Luther. Therefore, God accepts only the forsaken, cures only the sick, gives sight only to the blind, restores life to only the dead, sanctifies only the sinners, gives wisdom only to the unwise fools. In short, He has mercy only to those who are wretched and gives grace only to those who are not in grace. Therefore, no proud saint, no wise or just person can become God's material And God's purpose cannot be fulfilled in that person. He remains in his own work and makes a fictitious, pretended, false, and painted saint of himself, that is, a hypocrite. I wonder how many hypocrites we have in church this morning. You say, what's a hypocrite? It's those who are building their eternal security on works that they have amassed. I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, instead of resting in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Luther says, and I agree with Luther, that if you're trusting yourself for your salvation and calling yourself a Christian, you're a hypocrite. So from this introductory section of Galatians, just the first 10 verses, what I want us to learn is I want us to learn together the characteristics of the one message of God's salvation. And so the title of this sermon today is God's One Saving Message. Write this down. This is point number one. The gospel is our mark of distinction. Now remember, we've defined the gospel, so we're understanding that you know the gospel, that glorious good news of God restoring us into fellowship with Himself through Christ. So the gospel is our mark of distinction. We are a distinct people because of our particular confession, and our particular confession is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul, all through his life, this message was so revolutionary. It was back then, and it is today. It's so revolutionary. He faced opponents all through his life all through his time as a preacher. And in this case, there were those who were insisting that in order to be a Christian, you had to add to the finished work of Christ. So Acts 15 tells the background story behind what's going on in Galatians. Acts 15 says this, Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren. Listen to what they were teaching. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Did you hear what they said? Unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. Now, we don't uh, know much about circumcision, or I'm not going to tell you about circumcision. That's not my purpose. But we substitute circumcision for other things. Unless you're baptized, you can't be saved. Unless you belong to a church, you can't be saved. Unless you pray, you can't be saved. Unless you do this, you can't be saved. There again, what's the mistake there? You're mistaking what the gospel is for what the gospel does. And when you try to add, listen closely to this statement. When you try to add to what Christ has accomplished on the cross, here's what you're saying. The cross of Christ is not enough. Christ crucified is not enough. But dear friend, if the cross is not enough, 
then how much is? If the cross is not enough, then how much is enough? And the reason there's silence in the room is because there's no way to answer that. If the perfect Lamb of God crucified, the sinless Son of God crucified, is not enough to bring you to heaven with Him for forever, to forgive your sins and give you new life, if that's not enough, then nothing is enough. And so Paul was combating these false teachers who had infiltrated these young churches. And God sends His apostle, He sends Paul to direct the minds and hearts of those that He served towards what saves. And what is it that saves? The gospel. Jesus alone saves. Notice the way that He identifies Himself. Look at what He says here. He says, Paul, an apostle, in verse 1, pay close attention, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised Him from the dead. Now, that word there, I have it underlined in my Bible. I encourage you to underline it if, uh, if you enjoy writing in your Bible. Uh, that word underlined in my Bible is apostle. That word apostle is a transliteration of a Greek word which comes from apostolos. Now, the pastor just spoke Greek, but it sounded like English, right? You can do it too. Apostolos is the, where we get the word apostle. It's the same thing that we do with baptism. The word baptize is the Greek word baptizo. You can hear the English already there. And so this word is a transliterated, and it literally means one who has been sent with a message. Now, this is what I want to encourage you with. There is a sense in which all Christians are apostolos. We're all sent with a message, but not all of us are apostles. The office of apostle is reserved for those who are commissioned by the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul has apostolic authority, whose source is not based upon man, look at the text, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. You see, Paul is referring to the day that he was set apart by Christ on the road to Damascus. Christ commissioned him. He apostled him. He sent him out with a message. And Paul wants to make it perfectly clear because the truth that he's going to unfold is going to rub against every inclination of our trusting in our own selves, our amassing in our own selves, this feeling that I have done it, I have done well. Paul says that his message didn't originate from anything that he could think of. It wasn't from his own inclinations. Paul further, he says, it's not from men nor through men. He says, I can't even go around in my culture and find anything close to this. What does that mean for us? It means that he couldn't, he couldn't find a cultural phenomenon that resulted in his call. He wasn't just going with the crowd. He wasn't just joining a movement. In many ways, Paul was leading a movement. And it's that movement that's come to us today, that gospel-centered movement of a message that only God saves. So Paul's call was from a resurrected Lord who is ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father who is patiently waiting for the time that all things will be put under the Savior's feet. And what it set Paul apart is the same thing that sets us apart. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truths of the gospel, they're, they're, they're too rich to originate in, in our minds. Consider just what we say when we talk about our Christian confession. We say things like, God has come to make peace with us through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's a gospel confession. You go to your campus. You go to your school. You go to your workplace. You go to your family. And you say, God has come to make peace with me with you through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's a gospel expression. He offers Himself for us. His ways were the ways that were transgressed. We were the sinners. He, the Savior, we crossed the line. But the beauty of the gospel is because He loved you. When you were in your sins, when you were separated from Him, he didn't allow what separated us from Him keep Him from coming and saving us. 
he was wronged. And he took the initiative to make it right. We had everything to lose. He had nothing to gain. But he shared himself with us through Jesus Christ. And those are the truth that mark us. That's our gospel confession. We are the people of God. We are the faith-filled people of God who by faith trust in Christ alone. We are loved of God. I want to tell you this today. Maybe no one's told you so far. Maybe you've never heard this in your life. God loves you. And through Christ, you can be a person that He dwells with forever. We are the people of God, the loved of God, the forgiven of God. The gospel is our mark of distinction. Now, let's be clear. Let's be very clear. The fact that God, God is our distinction doesn't mean that we stand all by ourselves. Doesn't mean that we stand alone. Paul says, look at the language here in verse 1. He is an apostle, not from man, nor through man, but look at his posture. He doesn't stand alone. Look at what comes next in verse 2. And all the brothers who are with me. Number two, write this down. The gospel forms community. The gospel forms community. You see, think about the life and practice of Jesus. What do we know about Jesus? Jesus, he didn't just call Peter, did he? He called Peter, James, and John, and the rest of them. He called and formed a community. God created Adam. But what did he say about Adam? Do you remember? He said, it's not good for man or for humanity to be alone. So God then forms a community, and don't miss this. Remember, how did he form community in the garden? God said it's not good for man to be alone. You know what that tells us? It tells us that God forms the community through his word. Now that's important. That's important in our day and age. It's not that the community forms the word. We just all agreed on what should be the Bible. No, no. The word forms community. There's a particular group of people that come together based upon a particular confession. And the particular confession that we have is called, listen, the gospel. The gospel. This is why the gospel is not a simple thing. The gospel is not everything, but the gospel affects all things. God forms community through His Word. And the problem with the church in Galatia is that these false teachers, they were infiltrating infiltrating the community with false teaching. And here's Paul's problem with that. If the Galatians, if they adopt these false teachings, then they would not stand in congruence with the faith once delivered to all the saints. In other words, they would not be in Christian community. In other words... They would not be in fellowship with God. In our individualistic society, we need to be crystal clear here. We need community. You were designed for community. Christianity and community are synonymous. We need each other as the body of Christ. That's why in this church, for example, we talk about church membership. We don't say church membership in the same way that the country club talks about country club membership. That's two different things. The reason we talk about membership is because Paul says in the book of Corinthians that you are are Christ's body and individually members of it. We need each other as the body of Christ. And right now, In our present pandemic moment, we are scattered. We still are the church scattered because of the pandemic. Now, we have technology that allows the opportunity for casual worship, but listen to me carefully here. Online worship will never replace gathering together. 
It can't. Church is not church if we're gathered in a chat room. Please hear me. Right now, we're providentially hindered. I'm grateful for technology. I'm thankful for chat rooms. Chat rooms are necessary sometimes. But what I want you to hear in my heart is that they're never a replacement for you to make every effort as much as you're able, that's the key word, as much as you're able to come together for worship. I want to speak to our college students and our busy parents for just a moment. Any parent in particular who, with the rest of the college students who just moved back into town or into town or transferred from another town, it's an opportunity for the whole semester to start. And listen, I'm a, I'm a young parent, or I'm a parent with young children, whatever you want to look at it, and I'm not that far removed from college, doctoral school, maybe I should say, but anyway, whatever. I'm, I'm far removed. But the point that I'm trying to make is I want you to get into the habit of coming to church. Don't get into the habit of not coming which is the twisted side of the benefits of technology. You can get into the habit of not being in community. And I get it. Listen, I'm a parent of small children. I understand the whirlwind of Sunday morning, but I want you to remember your confession. And I understand today I'm preaching to the choir, but hear my voice in your head the next week. And the next week, remember your confession. The gospel forms community. The gospel means fellowship. Thirdly, the gospel means that we are part of the family of God. Now, this is is really a good point. The gospel means that we're part of the family of God. Look at this language. You can gloss over it if you're not careful. Look at verse 3. Grace to you and peace, here it comes, from God, our Father. You see that? He's already said the brothers who are with me, and then he says God is our Father. And then let's keep going. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of who? Our God and Father. To whom be the glory forever and ever, he says. So, through Jesus, who is the Son of God, we become sons and daughters of God. And look at that word. Look at what we know about God. God is Father. Our knowledge of God comes to us as Father. This is who He is. He reveals Himself to us as Father because that's who He is. We know Him and His relations to us and how He relates to the other members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the gospel means, listen, the gospel means that you and I are invited to share in that unity. God is a Trinity. He is a tri-unity, Father, Son, and Spirit, existing in a harmonious relationship of love. And God desires to bring you in to that relationship so that we can fellowship with Him forever. And we call Him Father. We call Christ brother. And we have the Spirit who fills our fellowship divine. You will see that God is not just the Father through Jesus the Son. He is our Father. This is why we can say, number four, Jesus is the gospel. We could summarize the gospel just by painting this portrait and saying Jesus is the gospel. Now, understand what I mean when I say Jesus. I'm not referring to maybe a Jesus of your imagination or some, some picture that you saw or some flanograph version. I'm referring to this Jesus, the Jesus of Holy Scripture. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus, God in the flesh. The Bible says here, In verse 4, he gave himself for our sins. 
Jesus is the gospel. I love the way the old Nicene Creed puts it. It says, for our sake, and that's the key term, for our sake and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, there again it's repeated, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. J.I. Packer, author of Knowing God, he summarized the entire gospel this way, God saves sinners. Jesus is a means by which God saves sinners, and He does it by the blood of His cross. And how God saves sinners is what makes grace so amazing. He initiated salvation. He sought us. He redeemed us by His blood. And the gospel only comes through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And any other message that does not put before you the it is finished of Christ and His cross is saying the cross is good news, but it's not the best news. Any message that doesn't highlight the it is finished of Jesus says what Jesus did is not enough. You see, number five this morning, the gospel delivers us from our present evil age. Look at this. Look at this. I hope that you notice the way that the text is put together. He says, Jesus gave himself for our sins. Why? to deliver us from this present evil age. And I love the way that he, he uses that language to talk about the, the age. He said that it's present, meaning that it's passing away. And because Jesus has come, we're guaranteed a brighter tomorrow that begins today. The gospel of Jesus, beloved, is unlike anything this world has ever seen. The gospel tells the story of God creating, God sustaining, God saving, and one day God summing up all things in Jesus forever. And that message pierces like light in a dark room, pierces our present evil age. The gospel is a message of good news and hope in a world filled full of despair and wondering where does our help come from. Does our help come from Washington? Does our help come from the court? Does our help come from the World Health Organization, the CDC? Nothing wrong with any of those institutions. But what do we say as believers? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You see how countercultural this message is? because it, it rocks us at our core. It says, don't trust in yourself, trust in Jesus. Our present age is marked with taking, but the gospel of grace gives. Our age is never satisfied. The grace of God is sufficient. Our age is wandering with countless questioning, but grace is sure. Our age is hurting grace brings healing. Our age is here today and gone tomorrow. The grace of God endures throughout all generations. Our present age is filled with strife. Grace gives peace. We're delivered while we're in the world to stay in the world tossed about like a chaotic sea, and our message to this world, be still and know that He is God. He will be exalted in the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. I just want to ask you a question this morning. Why would you depart from this message? Who in their right mind would run from amazing grace? But the fact of the matter is, so many do. This morning, in the stillness and quiet of your own heart, search your heart. 
and ask yourself, are you trusting God for your salvation? Or are you trusting in something that you have done or you will do? Baptism doesn't make you a Christian. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Giving to church doesn't make you a Christian. Again, you're confusing what the gospel is with what the gospel does. Are you trusting in Christ alone? As the old hymn writer used to sing, I have no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. Number six this morning and finally, the gospel is life's right direction. No wonder Paul was so astonished because there's not another gospel, because there's not another means of salvation. Any message outside of the gospel is heading away from salvation and life. And there's only one message that saves. There's only one message that gives life. And the message has a name, and His name is Jesus. The message that saves is the message of marvelous grace of our loving Lord, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see His face. Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace. Grace. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace. Grace. Oh, dear friend, God's grace, grace that is greater than all of my sin. Father, it's my prayer that everyone within the sound of my voice would say, Jesus is my only hope and salvation. Jesus is whom I trust in. We may have said that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. But the same is true then as it is now. Or we may have never said it at all. Jesus is my only hope. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I trust in you alone for my salvation. Thank you, Lord God, for sending Jesus the gospel of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.